Hi everyone, this is uh, Tim, your lecture instructor for the uh, Paramedic to RN Transition Program. And this uh, PowerPoint and voiceover is going to be based on diabetes. I will have to warn you, it's a little long. I'll try to keep it interesting. So type 1 diabetes myelitis. Uh, it's an autoimmune disease, usually diagnosed in children and young adults, and the beta cells are destroyed. So no insulin production and hormone needed to convert sugar, starches, and other foods is necessary. So for type 2 diabetes, myelitis, it's a progressive disorder, a combination of insulin resistance and decreased secretion of insulin, reduced ability of cells to respond to insulin. It will tell you that there is probably one slide for the type 1 and there's a million for the type 2. And I think the reason why is for the most part you're really going to take care of uh, more patients who are type 2 um, than type 1. And for the most part you're going to do interventions for type 2 diabetics that kind of apply to the type 1s also. So it, it's not... I'm not saying that there's not a difference between one and the other, it's just they're pretty similar to the point where there wasn't much needed for that was specific to type 1. So type 2 diabetes develops from obesity and physical, physical inactivity in a general um, susceptible person, um, often accompanied by hyperlipidemia, hypertension, and increased clot formation. Um, the way I think with diabetes, type 2 diabetics, um, I picture the stereotypical short, stocky person. My theory is is that uh, you're you're you were born and genetically you were supposed to have a height and weight proportionate body, and your pancreas was actually made for that. So if you actually gain more weight, your pancreas still is producing enough insulin for the amount of um, size and weight that you were born with. So if you become very short and stocky, uh, you're you're getting bigger and bigger and your body is not producing enough insulin to accompany that. So now there's other factors too, but again, like I said, I usually uh, stereotypically look at the, the shorter, stockier person and, and kind of think more of the di type 2 diabetic than anything else. So features of type 2 diabetes is middle-aged adults, um, abdominal obesity, inactive. High-risk ethnic populations are African Americans, Hispanics, American Indians, Asian Americans, and Pacific Islanders. And not to say that white people don't get type 2 diabetes, but I think um, ethnically and genetically, um, these groups tend to be more predisposed to the type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes myelitis, uh, what you're going to do is you're going to teach the patient about lifestyle changes, so have them lose weight, uh, diet, and exercise. Um, and I think, well, and a lot of people can, if you actually um, do lose weight, eat a regular diet and exercise um, and really maintain, especially for those who are taking oral um, diabetic medications, they can actually get off the medications. <clears throat> Features of type 2 diabetes is history of vascular disease, so they'll have hypertension, hyperlipidemia, um, HDL is less than 40 in men and 50 in women, the triglycerides are 150 or higher, um, the tri high triglycerides tend to predispose the uh, patient to the type 2 diabetes. Any of these health problems increase the rate of atherosclerosis, um, which actually will cause strokes or coronary artery disease. So you have to figure that the patient who is a um, blood sugar that is high and that's not actually controlled, it actually becomes thicker. Now you're trying to push thick liquid through, um, you know, hoses that aren't meant to take that much pressure. So um, the people who have uh, uncontrolled diabetes and thicker or higher blood sugars with thicker blood tend to um, possibly have strokes and um, um, especially either ischemic strokes or hemorrhagic strokes, and the coronary artery disease is just because of the blockage itself. So for assessment, you're going to look at age. It's more common in older adults. You're going to look at weight of children at birth, weight and um, I think it's supposed to be height and weight changes, major and minor infections, vaginal yeast infections, skin injuries becoming infected and taking longer to heal, visual changes, and sense of touch. So with, uh, let's see here, let's start with the skin injuries becoming infected and taking longer to heal. So um, with patients who have uncontrolled diabetes and have that thicker blood, um, it is harder to get that nourishing, um, good oxygenated blood to where it needs to go and actually heal uh, those in injuries and those infections. So 
that's why it takes a little longer. And um, in fact, I actually wrote down here page 1455. Um, it's a chart or some sort of block of 51-11. It's uh, for foot care. Um, I would definitely take a look at that. But um, but that's why we have patients who are type 2 diabetics that actually have foot ulcers um, that don't heal because it is the furthest part of your body. And um, again, if they're not able to control their blood sugars very well, then it tends to take a lot longer to heal. The uh, vision changes are going to be the the same concept. Um, you know, thicker blood um, can't necessarily get into capillaries that are microscopic, and, and that's exactly what the eye is. So uh, that's where you get the visual changes. Sense of touch, numbness and tingling in the pain. So you get the neuropathy, you get the uh, fibromyalgia, you get all the uh, you know symptoms um, due to the fact that the circulation is very poor. So as far as labs, um, normal glucose, um, this PowerPoint, when I made it um, a little while ago, um, I put it in here, it was 100. I believe the book actually mentions that it's actually 126. So um, so, so fasting glucose uh, test higher than 126 indicates impaired fasting glucose. Um, oral glucose tolerance test, so they give you a bunch of sugar, find out that if your body can actually... Um, normalize it, take care of it, and if you have a um, within range uh, blood sugar, then obviously you're not diabetic. If they give you a bunch of glucose and um, your body doesn't actually take care of it, then you are diabetic. So it's one way of being able to do it. The patient should be tested more than once to be accurate. Um, so you're doing these tests over and over to make sure that they truly are a diabetic. And the reason why I say this is because it's there's nothing worse than actually saying, yeah, you're diabetic, and then here's a bunch of pills, and then you go home, you take them, and then you end up having, you know, hypoglycemic events because of the fact that, um, you know, you're taking something to correct a problem that nece not necessarily was a problem. So other labs is an HbA1c. Um, how much glucose is attached to the hemoglobin hemoglobin molecule. Normal is anywhere from 4% to 6, and more than 8 is considered poor diabetic control. So this is actually a um, um, a test that they do, um, and and just like this says, the, the uh, glucose is attached to the hemoglobin molecule, so when they do this test, they're actually looking at um, a molecule that um, has glucose attached to it, but it's over a a very long period of time. So when you have that patient that comes in and says, oh, I've been really, you know, watching my diet and exercising and take my medication and stuff, um, and they come to be like 8, 9, 10, um, no, they really didn't because this is a sure way to actually tell you over, I believe it's a six-week period of time that um, um, whether or not they're truly controlling it. Um, I actually had a patient who was a new diagnosed diabetic. Um, he had never been told he was before, but he he was about 6'2 and about 250. Um, and he had the symptoms of being a diabetic. Um, the polyuria, the polygram, you know, the, too, uh, the peeing too much and the sweating and the, um, you know, all the symptoms of being a diabetic, um, but he didn't know what those really were. So he just kind of lived with the symptoms until he just kept getting sicker and sicker and more tired, and he just couldn't deal with it, and he came to the hospital. And he had HbA1c of 15. So um, that tells you that he had been um, very high for a very long period of time. So, But that's what the HbA1c, it's kind of a you know true serum as far as you know patients who tell you that they're watching and controlling it, but they're really not. All right, so other labs are going to be a urine test. This test for ketones in the urine. Ketones um, in the urine indicate the blood sugar is 300 or higher. You're going to do a urine albumin. Um, this is protein in the urine. Uh, urine glucose, this is uh, um, testing blood, but it's obviously the urine. <laughs> Other symptoms of diabetes is urinating often, feeling thirsty, feeling hungry, extreme fatigue, blurry vision, cuts and bruises that do not heal quickly, and weight loss. All right, so you have diabetes, and now what? I think the biggest thing we could possibly do is education and educating our patients. Um, they can't get enough of it. They can't hear enough of it. Um, we can't uh, say enough about it. Um, it's just reiteration and just kind of pounding it into their brains um, as far as what it does you know, what it is, how we can control it, what they got to do to make sure that they're either not too high or too low. It's a, it's a balancing act, and, and, um, and the only thing we really can do is educate them to keep them out of the hospital and to keep them um, as healthy as possible. 
So for hyperglycemia, this is where your blood sugar is uh, really um, is really too high. So uh, causes uh, type one and type type two. Um, you ate more than you planned. You exercise less than you planned. Uh, stress from illness, stress from life, and the Dom phenomenon. So um, if you eat too much. Um, and you don't either take insulin or take your oral diabetic medication, um, your sugar is going to go up. If you actually exercise, your blood sugar will go down. So if you eat too much and you don't exercise, then you didn't really do much to burn off what, you know, as far as the sugar that's actually floating around. So if you eat right and exercise, then you have a really good chance of actually lowering your blood sugar down to a normal level. Your blood sugar can also go high from stress from illness, whether it be a cold or a flu. Um, stress from life, stress in general will cause your blood sugar to actually go up. Now with Don phenomenon, uh, what that means is that um, you're, you're taking diabetic medication most of the time it's injected insulin um, that lasts for a certain amount of time and if you take it before you go to bed and it lasts for let's say 12 hours and you sleep 14 15 hours um, and you're not really consuming anything to keep your blood sugar at a normal level there's too much insulin that's actually working and it actually drops your uh, blood sugar and we'll go over that in class i think it's kind of important but it's a little hard to understand but hopefully it makes a little sense so symptoms of hyperglycemia is a high blood sugar, check your blood sugar often, um, high levels of sugar in the urine, frequent urination, increased thirst, feeling hungry, extreme fatigue, and blurry vision. So again, when you have too, too high of a blood sugar, uh, you'll have all these symptoms. And they're actually very common. This is not something we're kind of saying, well, you, know, you should be able to see these. These are things that you truly will see in every patient who hits a certain amount of blood sugar level. Um, either one, they don't tell you that they do, or um, you know, they kind of live with the symptoms long enough that they, that they just kind of expect it to be like that. <clears throat> so if it's untreated, you'll get ketoacidosis. Uh, it's from broken down fat, and you'll get increased urination. Shortness of breath, breath smells fruity, nausea and vomiting, and dry mouth. Um, you know, with other diseases, based on homeostasis, your body's trying to fix the problem. Um, so with ketoacidosis, your body's trying to expel from whatever orifice it has to be able to get rid of, um, you know, either be fluid or um, whatever it can do to actually get it to go down. So that's why you get the increased urination. Um, the uh, shortness of breath is because of the acidosis, and the nausea and vomiting, again, is from you, your body trying to, to get rid of the um, high amounts of sugar. So this can all be prevented by um, checking your blood sugar um, and treating it when it gets worse, and diet and exercise. And it sounds simple, and I mean, I can really, you know, say to my patients, oh, if you just diet and exercise, this will go away, but it, it's it's hard. It's harder than that. You can't just look at people and tell them to do something that they already know to do or that they have tried to do and actually failed. So you have to be able to come up with creative ways to be able to get them to understand and, and, and figure out tricks and and things that you can actually, the things that they can actually do to get their blood sugars um, lower. So for diet, um, 45 to 60 grams of carbs per meal. Uh, foods with carbs are grains, grain-based foods, which is bread, cereal, pasta, and crackers. You got starchy vegetables, which are potatoes, peas, and corn. Fruit juices, milk and yogurt, dried beans, sweet snacks, low-calorie sweeteners, sugar, alcohols, and even fiber has carbs in it. So you want them to actually eat between 45 and 60 grams of carbs per meal. Um, but it's interesting how, you know, we tell them that, but we don't really kind of tell them what they should and shouldn't actually eat. Um, you have to start teaching them how to read labels on boxes. Um, you have to be able to teach them that, you know, certain things that you would think would be low in carbs actually have a lot of carbs in them. So it's, it's, it's kind of like I said, it's a balancing act, but you're trying to do the best you can to be able to teach them. Now, I will also tell you, though, too, in my um, thought process as a nurse, um, you know, the, the gentleman that I had that uh, I think he was about 35 years old that had the, um, the newly diagnosis of diabetes, um, I could not go into his room, tell him that you were going to eat these certain amount of foods um, per meal, per day, um, and do that for the rest of your life. He was it, between the diagnosis itself 
and being able to understand what it is, the the disease process, the symptoms, what hyper means, what hypoglycemic means. Um, there's just so much information that I couldn't just walk in there and say, here's one more piece of, of evidence or um, information, and that's your eating habits. Um, so what you do is you try to give them a little bit of time, let them absorb it, let them understand it, let them ask questions about it, and and kind of go from there. Um, now, it, it's not going to happen in one day, and you know if the patient, he was only there for three days, so by the time I actually got done taking care of him over a three-day period, he didn't really get a, a large fraction of the information that he needed, but it's it's a step-by-step -step process. You have to be able to pick your battles, figure out what's more important for him to learn and actually get anything else. And I spent three days showing him how to give himself uh, insulin injections. Um, so you got to do what you got to do. So for exercise, um, balanced food consumed with insulin doses and activity for type 1, uh, balanced food consumed with medication and activity for type 2. So again, you know, you're going to balance your uh, the amount that you eat and the actual amount of activity that you uh, do and the amount of medication that you take. So it's a, it's a balancing act. <clears throat> Exercise lowers, lowers blood sugar. So, if you're, um, you know, diabetic and you're planning on going to the gym and um, and you skip breakfast, um, and let's say your blood sugar is at 100 or 150, and you go to work out, you're going to start dropping your blood sugar because of the fact that exercise actually burns um, the sugar and it actually lower it. Um, if you skipped breakfast, went to the gym, and took your insulin, then it's going to be much, much lower because of the fact that now you not only have you burned off what you had, but you also took a medication to get rid of what you had. So um, your best bet is to actually eat a, a good, healthy breakfast work out, take your medication, and check it before and after. So to prevent the lows, know your blood sugar before activity, test before and, act, and after the exercise. If blood glucose is less than 100, uh, eat a snack. Carry juices and glucose tabs. Uh, vigorous exercise causes stress, and uh, that causes the blood pressure, blood glucose to actually rise. So um, just keep that in mind that uh, normal workout activity you know, um, will actually lower because you are burning it, but then because of stress and the breakdown of muscle um, in order to re be rebuilt will actually cause your blood sugar to go up while your blood glucose rises so it's too much food uh, with uh, more carbs not active enough not enough insulin or oral medication side effects from medications can actually cause your blood sugar to go up illness uh, will cause it to go up pain because it's a stressor menstrual periods um, probably more based on dehydration than anything else and then the dehydration itself all right, so other reasons why your blood glucose will fall is not eating enough carbs. Uh, alcohol will cause your blood sugar to actually fall. Uh, too much insulin or oral medication and too much exercise. So how to lower your blood glucose uh, with oral medication for type 2 diabetes or a combination of oral medication and insulin if orals aren't enough. So you will have some patients who will take um, some oral medication and then they'll have some that actually need the oral and the, um, the sub-Q. Um, one thing I was going to bring up too, as I remembered this, um, so a couple things. One, oral oral diabetic medication, especially metformin, is very hard on the kidneys. So, um, and it doesn't necessarily affect, affect diabetics per se, but if you have a patient that comes in that normally takes an oral diabetic medication, usually the doctor will take them off of it um, because um, if there's any, any point that your patient is in the hospital that needs a CT scan with contrast, contrast is also very hard in the kidneys. So the combination of the two will actually uh, do a lot of damage. So they tend to take patients off the oral diabetic medication um, with the intent that they're just being you know, proactive. Um, and your patient will probably be put on um, insulin or subcutaneous insulin. Um, and they might ask you, well, I'm not sure why I'm taking this. I don't do this at home. Well, it's to keep their blood sugar at a normal level. And we can actually control it better by being in the hospital and checking their blood sugar, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and before they go to bed and at four in the morning. And uh, and that's, that's why they actually do that. So... Uh, let's see here with insulin with type 2, type 1 um, or type 2. So they'll do insulin therapy. So this is kind of very important. And I think there's actually on page 1429, there's actually a list of the subcutaneous insulin. So really, you, I can't tell you other than you just have to memorize them and you'll need to know them for the test and your NCLEGs and in your career. So 
you'll need to know the insulin therapy is as far as the rapid acting, short acting, intermediate acting, long acting. Um, you'll need to know your injection sites. And um, on this slide, it's administration of cloudy and clear. Um, that actually came from a different book, but also in the same sense too, as I remember this, um, they, I've never done that in my career. Now, I'm not saying that you should not know how to do cloudy and clear, but it's I won't test you on it, and I doubt if hand clogs would either. So, all right. So, patient teaching. So, pe teach the patient um, the insulin types, injection techniques, um, how the body will respond to the insulin. So, not only does your patient have to know what the symptoms of of being a diabetic are, but you also have to be able to teach them. Okay, so here here's what you felt like when you came in when your blood sugar was sky high, and that's here's your symptoms. You also then have to actually teach them what the symptoms are when their blood sugars are within a normal range. And they also have to teach them how the symptoms are when they're actually uh, too low. So that way they can say, hmm, I feel like this, I must be high, let me check my blood sugar. Oh, I feel like this, my blood sugar must be too low. I should be able to either do this, whether it be hard candy or check the blood sugar. But you have to be able to teach them what the feelings are because there are so much feelings as far as side effects that they're not quite sure if it's too high or too low and they can't remember. And then next thing you know, they're giving themselves either more sugar or more insulin and then they're causing problems. So again, a lot of it's teaching and then being able to understand um, what it is and how their body reacts to it and what they, and, and some of these people have lived with diabetes for so long that they don't know what it feels like to, to feel normal. Um, so that a lot of that is just surprising to them. So, so teach them uh, the insulin types, the injection sites, uh, the response to it, um, absorption, absent, and duration. So again, there's based on the insulin that they give themselves, it, there's a, um, you know, you give yourself insulin at this time, it should start working at this time. There's a peak time, and then there's actually a time when it starts to start to wear off. And they have to know that, so that way, based on eating, exercise, or when to give themselves the next dose, so that way they don't become too low or too high. Insulin regimens uh, duplicate uh, the normal insulin release pattern and sticking to schedules. So again, there's a lot of information for them to be able to learn, and, and you have to be able to try to squeeze in as much as you possible. So metformin, glyburide, and glipizide, uh, they're anti-diabetics, they're oral. Um, usually they're given either once or twice a day. You can give with food, but don't crush them because they're probably extended release and crushing it probably makes them more effective. I check their blood sugar for, uh, before, during, and after. Um, and then the education. Alcohol increases the effectiveness of this. So um, they need to know that, especially your uh, ETOHers or people who, you know, I mean, it's, there's nothing wrong with drinking, but, you know, if they decide to actually go out on a Friday night and, and drink their, until they can't drink anymore, uh, this will actually um, be worse because of the fact that um, it will lower their blood sugar to the point where they could possibly become comatose or not make good decisions as far as eating. And if they don't eat, then it just keeps dropping their blood sugar lower and lower. <clears throat> Side effect of insulin, hypoglycemia. So this is where you don't have enough uh, sugar in your blood. So this is where the blood sugar uh, drops below 70. Um, it causes shakiness, nervousness, or anxiety, sweating and chills, clamminess, irritability or impatient, confusion and or delirium, rapid uh, fast heartbeat, lightheadedness and dizziness, it'll cause hunger and nausea, sleeplessness, blurred vision, headaches, weakness and fatigue, anger, sadness, lack of coordination, seizures or unconsciousness. Um, so, I mean, it, it seems like a lot, but for the most part, I always, uh, I've heard that mnemonic, uh, cold and clammy, give some candy, uh, warm and dry, uh, must be high. So I kind of think about those things as far as symptoms and whether or not they're high or they're low and stuff. But uh, um, So treatment for hypoglycemia is consume 15 to 20 grams of carbs or glucose, recheck the blood glucose in 15 minutes. If it's low, go ahead and repeat it and start low and go slow. So what this means is that if you are, let's say, you know, 30, 40, or 50 as far as the blood sugar, um, you know, you can do things uh, or take things, whether it be hard candy, whether it be um, uh, sugar packets, uh, whether it be jelly. Um, I've, I've heard of the cake icing. Um, there's a million things that you can actually do to get your blood sugar up and very quickly. 
but what you want to do is actually kind of go low and 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 start off slow and uh, what that means is that you don't want to go from 30 to like 300 because then you're gonna be fighting to try to get back down so if you kind of go a little bit at a time get it from 30 to 40 to 50 and let's say you go to one you know 150 that's okay um, but you just don't want to go from 30 to you know hundreds and then if it returns to normal plan the next meal so again once you do get it up to a certain point that it seems to be normal then keep rechecking it uh, just to make sure that you aren't going to go back down so a little tidbit, um, if your patient took an insulin that lasts 12 hours, or if your patient takes Lantus, which is a 24-hour insulin, because their blood sugar dropped and they took something to get it back up does not mean the medication stopped working. So they have to continuously check it to make sure that they don't keep dropping even though they felt good for a certain amount of time. So have them keep rechecking and keep make sure that they're where they're supposed to be and kind of try to keep fixing it until the medication wears off. So glucagon is also a medication that the patient can take that will actually get their uh, blood sugar up. So it treats hypoglycemic, blood sugar that's less than 70, give as an injection. Um, in the hospital, we actually give it as an injection or you, they also have glucagon tablets. Teach patient and caregiver about low glucose episodes and symptoms, and evaluation increases the blood glucose level. So again, you want to be able to check the blood sugar, fix the blood sugar, and then recheck to make sure that it either hasn't gone too high or too low, or that you've actually done what it was supposed to do. So what are 15 grams of simple carbs? So we have glucose tablets, we have gel tube. I think it's, uh, there's like a, t a tube full of gel that you can actually kind of uh, give them. And, and usually we'll put it like either um, in their lip or under their tongue because it actually absorbs pretty fast. Two tablespoons of raisins, uh, four ounces of juice or regular, um, I, I call it pop because I'm from the Midwest. Uh, one tablespoon of sugar or honey, eight ounces of non-fat or 1% milk, and then hard candies or gumdrops. Um, or you can give glucagon, which is um, the hormone that stimulates the liver to release through glucose. So uh, one thing I was going to point out though too, um, so you can give these things to actually cause their blood sugar to go higher or back to where you want it to be. But a little FYI, you can only give these to people who are actually conscious. And that sounds stupid, but um, you'd be surprised at um, people who are not um, either um, able to control their own swallowing or they're lethargic. I mean, they have to be able to understand the directions you're giving them for them to be able to do it. So if you find somebody who's actually passed out um, on the street and their blood sugar is low, um, you can do certain things, but you have to make sure, make sure that they either don't choke on it or they can actually swallow or, you know, obviously you're not going to go up and give, you know, two tablespoons of raisins to somebody who can't, you know, understand um, or is not conscious. But uh, that was my point. <clears throat> Blood glucose control in hospitalized patients. So um, they've got stress hyperglycemia. So stress causes blood sugar to go up. Illness tends to make blood sugars go up. Uh, you're laying in bed all day long, so you have uh, decreased physical activity. Um, you're also withholding their anti-diabetic medications like metformin because of the CT scan. Disease or drugs that can cause hyperglycemia are steroids, TPN and PPN, which is the... Um, IV uh, liquid nutrition, and then we also have two feedings. So um, with hyperglycemia, like I said, stress, infection, fevers, um, yeah, there's a million things that can cause your blood sugar to go up. And as far as um, steroids will also make it go up. So your patients who are type 2 diabetics and um, COPD, you tend to give steroids to make their CPD COPD not as uh, exacerbated. And that's great for their lungs and allows them to breathe, but it wreaks havoc on your diabetes. Um, again, TPN and PPN, those patients who have abdominal either surgeries or um, aren't able to absorb food, um, there does mean they're not diabetic anymore. And uh, you give them TPN and PPN, and they're um, basically it's sugar water with nutrients in it. So you have to make sure that there's insulin in it to make sure that they don't go hyperglycemic. Uh, let's see here. Um, other things for hospitalized patients. Infections rate. Uh, blood glucose could be higher due to infection. Patient has a greater chance of developing an infection due to diabetes. So not only does your patient who have diabetes, um, their sugar will go up because of infection, but also because of 
um, I wouldn't say they're immunosuppressed, but you know they have a better chance of catching other diseases um, and disease processes, so that causes them to be susceptible. Uh, let's see here, a hospitalized patient may also develop hypoglycemia, and this could be due to inappropriate insulin type, uh, timing of meds and insulin administration. Hospitals tend to use a sliding scale. Um, Honor Health used to use a sliding scale of one unit for every 50 over 100. So if your blood sugar was 150, we'd give you one unit to get you down to 100. Now we use something called Glucomander, and most nurses hate it, but um, I think what it is is that we have to trust a program that we don't like, and that drives us crazy. So, um, But you know, your patients know better. With those who are compliant that actually have taken insulin at home or know their bodies and know their symptoms and are very well educated, listen to them. They can actually tell you how they feel and when they take stuff and when they don't, and um, we tend to get kind of the, you know, the nurse tends to become more of the... Uh, I don't want to say power trip, but just kind of like, well, this is how we do it, and that's not really fair to the patients. So, uh, let's see here, you also could uh, become hyperglycemic because of being NPO, um, or um, you know, because you're not able to actually swallow, we put you on insulin, um, and that could also make you hypoglycemic too. So. Uh, let's see, enhancing surgical recovery. So you may have a patient who is diabetic in need of surgery. Your plan and, and expected outcome is uh, good wound healing, absence of infection, blood glucose levels within a normal range, and discharge readiness. This includes educating the patient on their procedure and their diabetes. So again, anything as far as uh, stress, um, incisions, infections, um, there's many things that cause your uh, blood sugars to spike or or because of it going up, this does not allow wounds to heal properly. So patients who are having surgery, not only do you have to actually control their blood sugars while they're in the hospital, but you also have to be able to make sure that they're able to heal properly and educate them well enough that they're able to do the same thing at home. So um, keep that in mind. Preoperative care is in step stop metformin 48 hours before surgery, put um, on intermediate insulin. So again, you're going to take them off the metformin. You'll put them on the sub-Q injections. Keep blood glucose levels uh, below 200. Higher levels promote infection and slow wound healing. So and the reason I think they chose 200 is because I think it was too hard for them to be at 100. Um, and 200 for a surgical patient is acceptable. Intraoperative and postoperative care. Uh, intraoperative care is IV insulin, glucose, and potassium. Um, this is to keep blood glucose 140 to 180. That reduces wound infection. Postoperative care is IV insulin that may still um, still be used. Keep blood glucose levels between 140 and 180 uh, for critically ill patients, and then keep blood glucose level around 110 for med surge patients. So again. They know your blood sugar is going to go up because of the fact that you have had surgery. Um, and 140 to 180 um, on critically ill patients is acceptable. Uh, when they're on the med surge floor, the 140 to 180 is not unacceptable, but I think the optimal is at least 110. So definitely watch for acute renal failure and hyper hypokalemia. Um, the more insulin you give, the more it actually drops your potassium level. So uh, keep that in mind. So post-op diet, always assess for bowel sounds after a patient has had surgery. Uh, as the bowels become active, the patient can start to consume solids and liquids. Patient will start on a clear diet and then advance as tolerated. Clear liquid diets um, should total of 200 grams of carbs a day and um, not be sugar-free. Two feedings, 50% uh, carbs, advance the patient's diet as fast as possible. Um, the reason why is because obviously if they're on clear liquids, that has a lot of sugar in them and uh, you're trying to play that little balancing act. And the more they actually eat and the better off they're starting to wake up their gut and their body can actually use it. And then plus you get a lot of proteins which allow um, wound healing. Patients on TPN have less of a worry due to insulin being added to fluids. So with TPN, um, again, it's it's um, IV fluids with nutrients in it. They can actually add insulin to it. So that way when you're uh, um, on the IV fluids, it will control your blood sugar as, uh, it's, as it drips. <clears throat> 
So we also have neuropathy. Uh, peripheral neuropathy, a result of damage to your peripheral nerves, often causes weakness, numbness, and pain, usually in your hands and feet. It can also affect other areas of your body. So sensory nerves that receive sensation from the skin, such as temperature, pain, and vibration, or touch. So basically it's numbness and tingling uh, due to the diabetes itself. It will usually affect the hands and the feet, especially the legs and the feet. I think that's probably more of, a, uh, of an area than anywhere else. Um, because of that, temperature, pain, and vibrations um, tend to just really set people off. And um, I've assessed patients before where I've, you know, assessed for edema in their lower extremities, and as I kind of, I don't, as I squeeze or at least touch them, that it just it doesn't feel good. But are nerves that control how your muscles move. So again, the neuropathy really just does affect a lot of uh, nerves and, and a lot of muscles. So for patient teaching, the number one intervention is prevention of injury. So other teaching is uh, follow foot care practices, cleanse and inspect feet daily, wear pro properly fitting shoes so you don't get blisters, avoid walking on bare feet so you don't step on something, especially with neuropathy, um, you know, with that numbness and tingling. I've had patients step on nails. I've had them step on tacks. I've, I mean, they've stepped on everything and not even know that they were there. Um, and then have them see a podiatrist often. Um, I think one thing that... Um, we don't do is you will never find uh, nail clippers in a hospital because um, you know you don't want your patients clipping their own nails. You don't want nurses clipping their nails um, because it what it will do is if you happen to either nick um, the toe or if you actually cut a little too deep, then you've now just um, created a wound that will never heal. So. Uh, let's see here. Side note, diabetic patients with neuropathy who develop foot ulcers tend to lose their feet, uh, toes, and lower extremities. So, um, and it's true. Um, patients, because of lack of blood supply or because of ulcers um, and them not healing, um, sometimes you really just have to cut off what's not healing. And that could be toes and their feet and their ankles, and they just really go from there all the way up their leg until it's all gone. So for wound care, um, moist wound environment, uh, wet to dry dressing, we have debridement or necrotic tissue and elimination of pressure, uh, pressure and don't walk on it. So for wound care, if you have patients who actually have foot wounds, um, the wet to dry dressing is to um, keep that wound nice and moist so that the blood supply stays. If it actually gets very dry, it will become necrotic or it's almost like a scab that just um, it, it just isn't doing anything. It's not serving an actual purpose. It's dead skin. So by keeping it moist and keeping the blood supply as good as it possibly could get, uh, the wound may actually eventually heal. Uh, Dorema and narcotic tissue. So I've had doctors at the bedside bring in pretty much a scalpel and pretty much cut whatever uh, dead skin and, and tissue and whatever is there off. And by actually causing it to bleed, it will cause it to heal. So, um, and then elimination of pressure, so don't walk on it. So I've had patients who have literally had, uh, you know, toes amputated, and then they're walking around the unit as if it's nothing. And because of the neuropathy, um, they don't really feel it. So um, they're not doing themselves very good. So a lot of that has to do with education too. So managing the pain, um, you got the uh, neuropathic pain. Symptoms of neuropathy is burning, muscle cramps, piercing, stabbing, darting pain. Um, Metro, uh, met, metatarasia, which is probably numbness of the toes. Hyperalgesia, um, you got um, allodynia, tingling and numbness, and medication that can help this is Lyrica, Cymbalta, and Neurodin. So <clears throat> I've had patients who have been on Lyrica and they do like it. it what it basically does is kind of uh, controls the tingling and the, and the numbness and kind of, um, you know, brings that that burning feeling down to a minimum. Um, neurotin actually works rather well. Um, I've had patients who have had too many side effects with neurotin as opposed to Lyrica, but Lyrica also has an opioid in it. So you got to kind of figure out what works best for you. So. So remember, patient safety, risk for falls, risk for injury, uh, risk of slow wound healing, and risk of increasing blood glucose. So this is a cycle. So again, you know, they come in for uh, a wound and, and high blood sugars, and you try to control one, and then you got a, a problem with the other, and, and it's just, uh, it's a balancing act. So reduced vision, diabetic retinopathy. 
Causes could be uh, poor blood control, blood glucose control, <clears throat> proteinuria, uh, diastolic hypertension, uh, long duration of diabetes. So what to do? So visit an ophthalmologist for functional vision assessments. Get appropriate eyewear and visual aids. If it is hard to see, how does someone draw up their insulin? So this is a good point. So you have somebody who is a, um, a diabetic that takes uh, subcutaneous insulin, and um, you know if they can't see real well. Health real well, then how do they know if they're drawing up the right dose or not? So at this point, they're maybe drawing up too much, and they become hypoglycemic, or they're not drawing enough up, and they're becoming uh, hyperglycemic. So, and, uh, you know, um, just because they know how to draw it up and give it doesn't mean they actually know how to use their glucometer uh, properly. So um, I, I use the expression garbage in, garbage out. So if they um, aren't using the right equipment and doing what they think is right, then it gives them a reading, then they're just going to do it based on that. So they have to be able to <clears throat> provide the right information to be able to get the right medication and, and the right dosage. So teaching for self-management, assess learning needs and readiness to learn. So again, if your patient comes in, they're all stressed out and they're uh, not really able to learn or pay attention to what you're teaching them, then there's no point. Um, I think that they have to be ready to learn it, be calm enough to be able to understand and obtain um, what you're giving them in order for them to uh, go home. You assess physical, cognitive, and emotional limitations. So uh, just because they seem to be alert and oriented doesn't mean that they can cognitively either retain what you're giving them or just because they can, you know, seem to be a walkie-talkie doesn't mean they can actually read and write. So um, you really have to be able to um, get to know your patients well enough to understand, you know, can they absorb what you're giving them? Um, can they follow instructions? Can they read um, articles that you give them? You know, there's a lot of information that you're throwing at them and then you got to figure out how they can actually absorb what you're giving them. Uh, survival skill information. So this is basically, you know, if you do not do any of this stuff, at least do this in order to survive. So, um, so again, there's so much information, but if you can at least pick and choose what's important and, you know, what is really, really what they need to know, then, then you can decipher that. <clears throat> um, and then psychological, you know, preparation. Like I said, they have to be able to understand and accept, you know, what's going on and not everybody can do that. So, so outcomes. After all this information and education, what do we expect? Um, we want them to achieve glucose control, avoid acute and chronic complications related to the diabetes, have a complete recovery from procedures without complications. We want them to have pain relief, uh, optimal vision, good urine output, good mental health, and less hyper and hypoglycemia. So again, you don't, you know, you just don't fix it. You gotta be able to balance it. All right. So here's the Don phenomenon. So all people have it, uh, diabetes or not. It's a surge of hormones every morning between 4 and 5 a.m. Diabetics do not have normal insulin responses to adjust for this, so blood glucose will rise. Uh, things to do to help. Eat dinner early in the evening. Do something active after dinner. And what it does is it actually allows um, your blood sugar to still stay as normal as possible. So with sick day guidelines, um, this is basically when a patient, um, you know, has the flu or, or got sick for whatever reason, um, and because of stress and infection and fevers cause blood sugars to rise, um, they still have to be able to take their insulin. And um, other things that will actually help make their uh, blood sugar normalize is eating. But if you're having nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, then you don't do that. So it just causes it to keep going up and up and up. So even if the patient is uh, sick and having nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, try to eat and drink plenty of fluids. So whether it be uh, Pedialyte, whether it be Ensure, whether it be, you know, a little bit of water or some juice, something that at least gets the, you know, something, you know, gets food in them. <clears throat> at least 50 grams every three to four hours. Uh, broth, crackers, juice, soups, jello, and applesauce tends to actually do this. Uh, check blood glucose every three to four hours, even during the night. Uh, daily weights, temperature, breathing rate, and pulse. Um, because your patient will, your patients know what's going to happen when they go to the hospital. So diabetic, especially when they're sick, they know that if they go to the hospital, they're going to give them some IV fluids and some insulin and all these things, and then send them a bill for a million dollars, and they could have done that stuff at home. So for your patients who are sick with the flu or whatever, 
they know what's going to happen if they go to the hospital. So they tend to stay at home and try to fix this on their own till it gets to the point where they feel so horrible that they literally have to go. Well, by then it's too late and it actually puts them in DKA. So you really have to be able to teach them, you know, try to consume as much fluids as you possibly can. Um, definitely check your sugar, take your insulin to make sure that you stay within a certain range. And then if it does just doesn't come down, then you have to go to the hospital. So teach them for signs of DKA, which is abdominal pain, vomiting, rapid breathing. Dehydration is going to be dark urine, dry mouth, fruity breath, and drowsiness. So that's what the sick day guidelines are, and you have to actually teach your patients that. All right, so that's the end. 45 minutes. Wasn't too bad. So anyways, bring uh, whatever questions you have to class. Um, definitely check out the uh, the foot care box. Uh, definitely memorize all your insulins as far as uh, giving them how long they last, um, when they start to really work, and then what the peak times are and stuff. And uh, and we'll do a lot of stuff in class as far as to get through this and make this a little more concrete. So definitely bring any questions, and I'll see you in a while.